What's going on everybody? Today we're going to be talking about lawmen in the American West. Which you can use to create a historically accurate lawman character in Red Dead Online. When we think of frontier towns in the Wild West, we tend to envision them as lawless places with constant gunfights and violence. We also tend to dismiss this image as one of the many myths of the American West. But what does the actual evidence say? Well, to find this answer, I had to dig deep into the data, both modern and historical. Currently, the title of deadliest city in the United States oscillates between St. Louis and Baltimore, with a per capita murder rate of around 60. Meaning that every year, if you were to randomly select 100,000 people in the city at the start of the year, 60 of them would be murdered by year's end. Again, that's not the total number of murders, that's per 100,000 residents. In 2020, the highest murder rate in the entire world was Los Cabos, Mexico, with a per capita murder rate of 111, nearly double the rate of America's deadliest cities. Now some of you viewers might be wondering, how do these figures stack up to violence in the Wild West? Is it more now, or was it more violent then? To answer these questions, I consulted the Historical Violence Database at the Criminal Justice Research Center at Ohio State University. In doing so, I was able to access per capita homicide rate tables for many areas in the American West during the 19th century which allows us to accurately compare murder rates across time and place. We'll start with the rowdy Kansas cow towns at the height of the Great Cattle Drives, roughly 1870 to 1885. During that period, the residents of Dodge City faced a homicide rate of at least 165 per 100,000 adults per year, about three times higher than the deadliest city in the United States today, and even deadlier than the deadliest city in the modern world. But it's interesting to note that Dodge City wasn't the most violent city in America this time, or even the most violent in Kansas. The cow town of Caldwell had a per capita murder rate of 168. Ellsworth was 239. And Abilene had a whopping per capita murder rate of 317. As for mining towns, Bodie, California had a per capita murder rate of 129. Bannock, Montana was 367. And the deadliest mining town, which just so happened to also be the deadliest town in the American West, at least according to the data we can access, was Deadwood, South Dakota, with a per capita murder rate of 420. 42, which is seven times higher than the deadliest city in the modern United States and four times deadlier than the deadliest current city in the whole world. Again, it must be noted that we're intentionally looking at the wildest towns of the Wild West here. Still, a random sampling of Western cities show vastly higher murder rates than today. In the mid to late 1800s, San Francisco's per capita murder rate was 31. Today, it's five. Sacramento was 47. Today, it's seven. Denver was 106. Today, it's nine. Even entire states have followed the same pattern. In 1870, Colorado's per capita murder rate was 137. Today, it's three. Montana was 212. Today, it's three. Even for its time, the West was a far deadlier place than the cities of the East. At the same time, Los Angeles had a per capita murder rate of 198. New York City's hovered around five. Now, with all this said, we must understand that the small population of the West skews our perception a little bit. For instance, in 2020, there were hundreds of murders in Chicago. By comparison, in 1876, Deadwood only had around a dozen. But Chicago has millions of residents, while Deadwood only had a couple thousand. So statistically, while there are far more murders in big cities today, they are far less in proportion to population. That is, on a per capita murder basis. Regardless, the Wild West was, well, <laughs> the Wild West. And it was this astonishing level of violence amongst a relatively small population that necessitated the need for lawmen, which came in a variety of forms. The primary lawmen of the Old West were U.S. Marshals, and under them would be Deputy U.S. Marshals. Then you have County Sheriffs, and under them would be Deputy Sheriffs, and Town Marshals, who had Deputy Town Marshals serving under them. But there were also other men involved in various aspects of law enforcement, such as Texas Rangers, Pinkertons, Range Detectives, and Bounty Hunters. <laughs> U.S. Marshals were officers of the U.S. District Courts. As the position was essentially a political one, the men that held these posts rarely had law enforcement experience. Instead, they hired experienced gunfighters as deputy U.S. Marshals to do the hands-on work. This would involve policing federal crimes such as bank robberies, mail robberies, or desertion from the Army. Many of the most famous outlaws of the Old West were pursued by them, including Billy the Kid, the Dalton Gang, Jesse James, and Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch. As they were federal agents, they didn't get involved in local robbery, shootings, or murder unless commissioned as deputy sheriffs or town marshals, particularly when the latter needed experienced help. Must be said, these guys were the real deal, dogged deputies who never hesitated to shoot it out with dangerous men, and unfortunately faced the consequences of such courage. Between the years 1872 and 1896, 103 
three deputy U.S. Marshals were killed in the line of duty. Yet, despite such costs, they often got their man. If you needed proof of that, look no farther than the old morbid photos of upright dead criminals surrounded by U.S. deputy marshals, who were notorious for taking such photos in order to provide proof that they had done their duty, in order to receive payment for their services. As we shift from districts to counties, the next layer of law enforcement officers were county sheriffs, who, like U.S. Marshals, were elected officials, often lacking in actual law enforcement experience. Similar to U.S. Marshals, county sheriffs depended on deputy sheriffs to do most of their hands-on work. As their name suggests, county sheriffs were an overall charge of a particular county. Their duties included maintaining the county jail, serving court orders, and collecting taxes and fines. As an incentive for doing their job, sheriffs were often allowed to keep a percentage of the taxes they collected. When circumstances as required, county sheriffs could deputize ordinary citizens to assist in protecting towns and forming posses to capture fugitives. As we shift from counties to towns, we reach the next level of law enforcement officers, town and city marshals. Unlike the elected positions of U.S. marshals and county sheriffs, town marshals were appointed by the mayor or city council to effectively serve the role of chief of police. As we've seen with previous officer types, town marshals hired several deputies to help carry out their duties. These were often called deputy town marshals, town constables, or simply policemen. When necessary, town marshals would call on county sheriffs and their deputies for assistance, and even deputies local town folk as well. The most common duties of town marshals included serving civil and criminal warrants, maintaining the town jail, locking up disorderly drunks, recording arrests, and collecting taxes and fines. Pinkertons were professional detectives that worked as part of Alan Pinkerton's National Detective Agency. While most folks called them detectives, Pinkertons actually preferred the term operative, which admittedly sounds pretty cool. As for their specific duties, Pinkertons engaged in the protection of express companies and railroads, both of which routinely transported large sums of money and other valuables. Pinkerton operatives were also hired to detect the identity of train, bank, or stagecoach robbers and track them down. It's important to note, however, that Pinkertons had no legal right to actually arrest the outlaws or thieves once they found them. Instead, they gathered evidence, identified their targets, tracked them to a location, then alerted local law enforcement to bring the outlaw into custody. The agency's symbol was an open eye with the motto we never sleep underneath it. A variation of this motto was the eye that never sleeps. The agency's logo and motto became so synonymous with successful detective work that it eventually led to the name private eye being applied to all private detectives who happily embraced the association. Suffice it to say the motto was brilliant, successfully striking chronic paranoia in the minds of outlaws everywhere. These guys were the bloodhounds of the American West who would stop at nothing to get their man. If they could track Butch Cassidy in the Sunday kid 10,000 miles south of their headquarters to a ranch in Argentina, rest assured they'd find you too. Texas Rangers were originally formed as a quasi-military force tasked with protecting American settlers from native attacks in Texas. In time, the skill sets they developed were utilized to track and capture outlaws, horse thieves, cattle rustlers, bank robbers, and any other criminals that threatened the safety and well-being of Texan citizenry. Texas Rangers were notorious for their mobility, tracking skills, and fielding the most modern weaponry available. By the mid-1870s, Texas Rangers carried Colt single-action 45 caliber peacemakers and Model 1873 Winchester carbines, ensuring that they were never outgunned. Due to the success of the Texas Rangers, other states followed suit, creating the Arizona Rangers in 1901 and the New Mexico Rangers in 1905. <laughs> Powerful cattle barons and associations often employed range detectives to look after the owner's stock. These weren't cowboys. These were professional gunfighters that patrolled ranches. You didn't want to tangle with these guys. While they had no legal authority to carry out violence, they certainly did so, and they were very good at it. Whether it was shooting, hanging, or simply driving off rustlers, range detectives employed whatever method was necessary to get the job done. <laughs> In the past, I did a whole video on bounty hunting, so if you want to dive into the details of that, you can check that video out. Now, I fittingly placed the bounty hunters last, as they were at the bottom of the law enforcement totem pole. Any man with a gun, nerve, and a motive could be one, despite having zero credentials, training, or experience. These lone wolf individuals who chose to engage in bounty hunting were generally seen as amateurs, scavengers, and low moral men, willing to kill others for money. As one might expect, they were therefore poorly regarded among settlers in the Old West. While the game has a dedicated bounty hunter role, historically few men, if any, engaged in bounty hunting as a full-time job because rewards were not offered frequently enough to allow for the development of 
professional class of bounty hunters who could make a consistent living at it. Now all that said, folks looked very differently on bounty hunting when it was performed by respectable lawmen or deputized posses. But this was a side venture for them, not their full-time occupation. All right, now that you guys know all the different types of law enforcement officers, let's talk next about how you can outfit your character as one. To start, we must understand that most traditional law enforcement officers, that is U.S. Marshals, Sheriffs, Town Marshals, etc., wore a simple three-piece black or other dark-colored wool suit. The only real way to distinguish one from another was the badge, which is sadly lacking in Red Dead Online. Still, you'll want to begin by putting together the standard suit. For this, you'll want to start with the black stovepipe square toe boots and the black tuxedo pants. Up top, start with the everyday shirt in white. Now, technically, this should be a pullover shirt, but Rockstar restricts certain ties as certain shirts, so we had to stick with it even though the collar isn't technically correct. On top of that, put on a black vest. I recommend the black paisley vest. Again, it isn't perfect, but it suffices. Then add a black worsted coat and puff tie, and you're all set. When it comes to hats, we finally get to see some customization. Bat Masterson, who served as the sheriff of Ford County, Kansas, of which Dodge City was the county seat, was famous for always wearing a black bowler hat. In Red Dead Online, this would be the derby high hat in black. The legendary Wyatt Earp, who served as deputy town marshal of Dodge City, and later in other positions, also wore a black flat-brimmed hat. In Red Dead Online, the closest option to this is a stalker hat in black. Pat Garrett, the sheriff of Lincoln County, New Mexico, and the killer of Billy the Kid, preferred a black hat with a slightly curved brim and a high crown. In Red Dead Online, the black Cayuga hat is the best option. The gunfighter long-haired Jim Courtright, who served as Fort Worth City Marshal, and later as Deputy Sheriff, Deputy U.S. Marshal, hired killer, and private detective, wore a very unique light-colored short-brimmed hat with a creased crown. While there is no perfect option for this in Red Dead Online, the Cordell hat seems to be the closest to accurate. Some traditional lawmen had a bit more flair in the way they dressed. The famous Deputy U.S. Marshal Bass Reeves, who made over 3,000 arrests, killed 14 men, and may have been the inspiration for the Lone Ranger, preferred to wear a unique checked suit and a tan, wide-brimmed, low-crown hat. To get this look in Red Dead Online, I recommend you start with Nozolita boots and the stripe-studded pants. On top, stick with the everyday shirt and white, tan traditional vest, and the folded string tie. The coat here really makes the outfit, so make sure you pick up the checkered Everman's jacket. Combine that with the tan military scout hat, and you're all set. Then there's Wild Bill Hickok, the town marshal of Abilene, Kansas, who seemingly just wore whatever the hell he wanted to. No other lawman was as original in dress, wearing buckskins on one day, a fur hat the next, in a flamboyant suit on the other. To keep things simple here, I put together an outfit based on a famous photo of Hickok while he was serving as the town marshal of Abilene. Think of this as a foundation on which to build. Start with the black stovepipe square toe boots and the black striped bandito pants. On top, you'll want a white lace-up patent shirt. Over that, place the black Richfield dress and the narrow handkerchief. Hickok was famous for his long dusters, and read that online, the shotgun coat is perfect for this. As for a hat, go with the tan military scout hat. Now, as Hickok was notorious for flamboyant dress, you can easily spice things up here by simply switching out the vest and neckwear. After that, you can try changing your shirt to a coffery ruffle shirt and throw in some plaid pants, such as a green tartan studded pants. Remember, this is Wild Bill Hickok. He wore everything, even a red sash, which comes with a Corrales shirt, by the way. So just about anything's possible. Now let's move on to the alternative lawman outfits. Like most law enforcement officers, Pinkerton operatives wore dark three-piece suits, but they also wore light gray ones. Their hats were usually black, with slightly curved brims and creased crowns. One of the best examples for this is Charlie Seringo, who successfully went undercover to infiltrate the Wild Bunch and was responsible for over 100 arrests during his illustrious career. While Pinkertons wore suits in their offices, they wore much more utilitarian attire when out on the trail tracking down outlaws. Going off of Charlie Seringo's trail attire, you want to purchase the brown tornado boots and clerk pants. Up top, go with the everyday overshirt, long sleeve, fully buttoned, and a dark brown military scout hat. While there's an immense variety of clothing worn by Texas Rangers, what is clear is that they tended to dress like Southern Range cowboys, minus the chaps and dust. Judging by the archival photos I found, most seem to prefer tucking their pants into their boots. Now we see this with Pinkerton Charlie Seringo as well, who is also from Texas, so it's plausible that this was just Texas style at the time. One of the best examples of Texas Ranger attire is illustrated in the photos of famed Ranger John Hughes, who served in that outfit for several decades. 
the uh, Texas Ranger, not the same pair of clothes. He's perhaps most famous for his ride of vengeance, following the murder of fellow Texas captain Frank Jones in Mexico. In response, Hughes crossed the border and tracked down those responsible. When the smoke cleared, he and his fellow Rangers had shot dead or hanged 18 of them. Like Bass Reeves, Hughes may have also been the inspiration for the Lone Ranger, particularly since the book that the series is based on, called The Lone Star Ranger, was dedicated to him by the author. To achieve John Hughes' Texas Ranger look, you'll want to purchase the worn stovepipe, square toe boots, and the black padded saddle work pants. Up top, you'll want the striped collar overshirt, narrow neckerchief, and the black traditional vest. Cap yourself with the tan military scout hat, and you're good to go. When going for a range detective, there's no better person to emulate than Tom Horn, who served as an army scout, cowboy, teamster, stagecoach driver, and a Pinkerton agent before becoming a range detective. Throughout his career, Horn killed an estimated 17 people, which would place him at the top of that morbid list compared to all other law enforcement officers. Horn didn't mince words when it came to his job, calling himself a cattle rustler exterminator. After allegedly shooting and killing an innocent 14-year-old boy, Horn was subsequently captured by the U.S. Marshals and convicted of murder. As he faced death on the gallows, Horn was such a badass that he adjusted the rope around his own neck and told the wavering executioner to keep his nerve. Like the Texas Rangers, Tom Horn didn't wear wool suits, opting instead to dress in cowboy fashion, which was a better fit for his work as a hired gun on the open ranges of cattle country. To achieve his range detective look, go with the worn stovepipe square toe boots, depot pants, and the Alvarado chaps. Up top, you'll want the frumpy shirt and the pattern bandana. For a hat, no surprise, you'll once again go with the tan military scout hat, which is the best representation in the game of the ubiquitous Stetson's Boss of the Plains, which was the most popular hat of the Old West. Like several of the previous alternative lawmen types, bounty hunters had no standard outfit, often just reflecting the regional dress of local cowboys, farmers, or town folk. And there's already enough examples of those in my other videos that there's no reason to spend any more time going over it all again. But here's what I can tell you with 100% confidence. Bounty hunters did not wear all black leather outfits with gold ornamentation. Of that, I can assure you. Thank you folks for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, please make sure that you like and you subscribe. Also, if you want to farther support the channel, please do so on Patreon. We've got a whole bunch of perks on there, so think about joining. It's a whole heck of a lot of fun. I think you'll enjoy it. Also, be sure to check out the Man vs. History Outfitter Shop where you can get all your gear for the modern frontier and support the channel in the process. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you folks next time. Before I go, I just want to make sure that I thank my Patreon patrons. Tyler Bioshock Rodriguez, Jason Victory, Ashley Gertensen, Teddy Bad Boy, The Innocents, Rich Christensen, Hurtin Wade, Comrade Krieger, Man vs. Moose, Dawson E., Bryce V., Zonk Breezes, Cyber, Noah Ovens, The Red Baron, Sneaky Ninja, and Yimzian. Also got to make sure I thank my silver and bronze tier Patreon patrons as well. You guys are absolutely fantastic. So thank you guys for all your support. Have a wonderful night.